Good evening and welcome everybody. My name is Luke Perry. I'm director of the Utica College Center of Public Affairs and Election Research. It's a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to our special event. I'd like to welcome Utica College students, faculty, staff, and alumni, particularly our distinguished panel, which I look forward to introducing in a moment. I'd like to welcome our friends from Colgate University and Syracuse University who have joined us, as well as community members and guests from around the country. Our mission at the Utica College Center of Public Affairs and Election Research is to serve citizens, students, journalists, and scholars by providing research and analysis. We do this through several ways. Some examples include our website, ucpublicaffairs.com, where we provide several articles per week written by a team of 50 contributors from around the country and read by an audience of over 150 different countries. We also have a book series with Palgrave Macmillan where we've published five books in the last two years on different aspects of US elections and we have several more on the way. Our final example are events like these, a panel discussion on a very timely topic, the benefits and challenges of modern polling. So audience members, as we get started, I just wanna share with you that you are all muted and we look forward to hearing from you in the form of your questions. And I ask that you do that through the, the chat function. We will work through different topics and questions over the next hour in the last 15 to 20 minutes or so. We look forward to incorporating audience questions. So we get started, I'd like to thank Tim Nelson and Tracy Pratt for their help in organizing this event. And now without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our panel of Utica College alumni. First, I would like to introduce Jim McLaughlin from McLaughlin and Associates. Mr. McLaughlin is a nationally recognized public opinion expert and political strategist whose clients have included US presidents, congressional leaders, and prime ministers, including Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu. He serves as a consultant and market research strategist for Fortune 500 companies and is a frequent commentator on television and radio programs. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Luke. Pleasure to be here. Next, I would like to introduce Jeremy Zogby from John Zogby Strategies. A graduate of the Utica College History Program, Mr. Zogby has over a decade of experience teaching history at both secondary and college levels before joining John Zogby Strategies in 2016, where he has been an integral part of the company's election polling efforts. He worked with BNY Mellon's Central New York Daily Analytics team. And he is current editor of the Main Street, K Street, Intelligence Year bi weekly report on the future. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to introduce Keisha Kluke from Bloomberg Government. Ms. Kluke is an investigative journalist who has received a number of awards for her work reporting on crime, politics, and education for the Times Union in Albany and Politico, among other media outlets, including our local newspaper, The Observer Dispatch. She's currently the New York State Correspondent for Bloomberg Government. Welcome, Keisha. Thanks for having me. So as we engage tonight's topic, I'd like to start in general terms and try to build some understanding of what polling is, and then get into different layers of detail as we explore the topic more fully. And I think perhaps one of the best ways we can do that is to turn to our pollsters and ask them in their own words, what do you do and why do you do it? So Jim, if you could get us started, what is polling? What are the defining elements of what you do? <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty simple, um, I think. You know, and I always, I always say, look, Polling is a form of market research. Um, and I know a lot of times when we see polls in the media and whatnot, they're using it to get clicks and they're using it to drive a story and whatnot. Matter of fact, you know, Keisha and I have talked over the years about various polls, which she'll ask us questions and whatnot. Um, but what it really, what it comes down to, it's a form of market research. And 98% of what we do in terms of polling, it's private work, whether it's for corporate clients or whether it's for political clients. And it gives us a snapshot of where things are now. But what I always say is what we're trying to use it for 
is to get to where we need to be. And I'll, I'll give you an example of it. I remember back in 2016 when we were working for the Trump campaign, um, the last week I was on Sean Hannity's uh, TV program on the Friday before election day. Um, and literally and Sean asked me, he said, do you think President Trump can win? And I said, yes, I think he can win. Um, because I had poll numbers in that last week where we were literally, we we're ahead in North Carolina, we we're ahead in Wisconsin, we we're ahead in Florida, and we we're literally tied in a place like uh, Pennsylvania. And people said, well, how did you know that you could definitely win? And I said, the reason I knew we could definitely win was it wasn't just the numbers that said we were tied in a place like Pennsylvania. It was looking at the art of the numbers where when you looked inside and you looked at those few, and there weren't a lot of voters that were undecided, but those few voters that were undecided, they wanted to change direction and move away from like Barack Obama. And if you looked at the voters, it was about 18% of the electorate that were unfavorable to Donald Trump and also unfavorable to Hillary Clinton. And they were, were telling you the ones that made a decision by about two to one, they were gonna vote for Donald Trump. So you saw that change dynamic that was going on there. So we use it as market research where you're looking for that intersection between what's important to the voters and what's important to your candidate. And you do the same kind of thing, you know, when, whether you do corporate marketing and whatnot, you want to see what's important to the consumers. You test the strengths, you test the benefits, you test um, what literally try to give people what they are looking for. And, you know, you're seeing it go on now, like, you know, just to make it a little bit more topical, you think about it, um, where basically how the um, how the Democrats are talking about their infrastructure plan, they're calling it a jobs plan, they're saying it's going to, you know, help the economy and help us get out of COVID and whatnot. Then you have a lot of Republicans that don't like it because they say the vast majority of the uh, infrastructure package, you know, well over 90 percent of it doesn't necessarily go for infrastructure. So you see those messages being tested on both sides. And those are the things we look for in, in polling. Thank you, Jeremy. Would you like to respond? Yeah, I mean, that was laid out beautifully, Jim. Um, I think you, you captured the essence of it. And I, I would agree with you that it's pretty simple. Um, really, the hardest part about it is asking good questions but then also when you see these, this set of data, cross tabs, as we call it, if you do a poll of you know, 30 or 40 questions, you're looking at 90 pages of data, some people get dizzy. And so you, you gotta know how to mine for the data. You, know, you gotta know where the gold is, you have to know where the silver, the copper, the minerals, you have to know how to sift through it. What's the, what's the story that emerges from it? I always say there's a unique story in every data set. There's also counterintuitive aspects to the data. You think you're, you should be looking for this. Be prepared to find another thing. Uh, snapshot indeed. I would only add to that a snapshot in moments time, all the while recognizing that it could change abruptly, the mood of the public. It could change gradually. If it's values, it tends to be gradual. It tends to, to be more set. But you know, major events can, can really uh, shift the mood uh, cataclysmic events, you know, just think of 9-11, for example, or even COVID. Um, I think what, you know, uh, at, at the at Zogby Strategies, what, what, what we focus on is what's the zeitgeist? What's the, what's the spirit of the age? What are the overarching theses or, um, or, or, or values that, that, that the public has? I mean, even though we're divided, there are a lot of things that the public can can agree on that fundament, fundamentally make us up as a nation, the culture. So we really probe in, into understanding that at the, the, the grand view, but also diving down into the subcultures and and breaking the data down in, in, into an, a digestible way. Thank you. And you, you mentioned the public and certainly polling is something that captivates the, the public's attention and has for some time. Keisha, you know, what role does polling have in reporting generally or on government in particular? Yeah, I think of it, I, I guess I think of 
polling usually is just one of many tools um, in my toolbox. So being able to use it for, um, I think Jim and I have talked on a number of occasions, um, you know, if uh, the Democrats in New York State uh, put forth this policy, you know, will will what will the voters think and what will that mean for them in future rounds of elections? Um, and, and that plays into, you know, the power dynamics uh, when I am covering state government in Albany, uh, the Democrats being in control at this point, having both houses and uh, the governor, but that could change very drastically in the next election. So kind of being able to read the tea leaves a little bit and figure out who the viable candidates are, who I should spend my attention on, you know, what topics, um, Recently, you know, we heard a lot of about um, wanting to pr to provide relief for you know workers and and those who were unemployed during this. So, being able to follow those topics more closely uh, because the polling kind of led you there, so you knew what was important to your readership as well. Um, and if, if people are interested in it, and you know, maybe there's a lot of confusion around a topic, and you want to clear that up. So, using it as sort of a a tool to steer both my reporting, my writing, um, and and hopefully being able to get a leg up on the competition is always helpful as well. Thank you. That provides a good inside view from a reporting perspective of, of polling. Jim, I'd, I'd like to turn back to you and, and try to get an inside view on candidates, organizations that are interested in, in hiring you and, and polling firms generally to do the kind of work uh, that that they want done. Can, can you explain a little bit of how things work behind the scenes when people look to you for market research and, and want certain information? Yeah, and, and look, you know, it's funny. When I first started in this long time ago, back in the Stone Age, I was literally working as an intern when I was a student at Utica College back in the 80s. Um, polling wasn't as prevalent back then as it is now. Now it's gotten to the point where everybody polls, you know, somebody running for town council and they're running for mayor, they poll major corporations. Look, if you're going to spend millions and millions of dollars, sometimes tens of millions and even hundreds of millions in marketing a product, you don't want to guess. You always want to look for that again, for that intersection between what's important to the voters, what's important to the, uh, what's important to the uh, customers. Um, and look, we get hired by, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And a lot of times I work with Democratic uh, consultants and pollsters. We, you know, there's, I think there was a project a few years back where we work with Jeremy's firm. We have a ton of respect for what they do and what his dad's been doing over the years um, because they really dig down into the numbers. But what, what you're trying to do for your client is, again, I always tell them, you know, what we're doing in a political campaign or whether we're doing it for a corporate 500 company, it's literally market research to test those messages, gauge not just where people are, but what are the messages we're going to use to move those people that we want to move? Like sometimes what you'll find is, you know, like, um, would you be more likely or less likely to vote for a candidate who... Uh, wants to increase education or make public education better. And you might get a 60, 70 percent, you know, think that's I'm going to vote for them, for him or her for that. You ask a question, you might say, well, so and so wants to find a cure for cancer. And you're saying, well, that's only like a 30 percent more likely. Why is that a 30 and yet education 60, 70 percent more uh, more likely? It's because they don't necessarily believe that candidate can find the cure for cancer. So you look for them what's believable, what's credible, and what matters to the voters and what matters to the consumers. And that's, that's, what, we, that's what we do. And what happens is too is, and, and Jeremy can probably speak to this a lot, it's a very small world in our business. You know, We know most of the Democratic uh, firms, we actually have people that work for us that have worked for some of the other Republican firms and whatnot. We all kind of know what we're doing. I will tell you on the Republican side, one of the things that they've done is over the last few years, they've kind of brought us all together on a semi-regular basis and we kind of compare best practices and whatnot. And there's really not a lot of secrets in terms of our, you know, in terms of what we're doing in, in terms of the business. 
Yeah, so let's, I can... let's hear some of those secrets, Jeremy. Uh, what what are some of the best practices? How do how do you mine for gold, as you put it earlier? Well, I you know it's funny that Jim said that. I mean, you know, we we were down in Miami. We before all of this, we used to frequent Miami quite a bit, and um, we we're we we're meeting with Mayor Francis Suarez, who we we discovered uh, was doing work with uh, McLaughlin and and Associates, and um, you know, we we ended up doing work for. Uh, for his father Xavier, former mayor in the 80s, who is now running uh, for uh, mayor of Miami-Dade County. So I mean, we're just really, you know, one degree uh, apart from each other just by clientele. Um, but I, I think again, uh, I think Jim hit the, the nail on the head. Politicians, candidates, whatever, are brands. They have personas. We as consumers relate to brands. We go into a store, we, we, uh, we, we, we feel a certain feeling from a logo and from a brand and from the advertising, and it makes us feel good, and we connect to it in a certain way, and, and we, we buy the product, and a lot of people buy it continuously. And it's the same thing with, with a candidate. They have a persona. They have a brand. But... What's most important is, uh, you know, unless you're like Bernie Sanders, who, you know, the, the, the rumor is, is that he doesn't use any pollsters. He just knows how to read his base, you know, that really that well. But um, most candidates have it in their mind that these five messages are going to, you know, they're just going to rock. They're going to rock the public. Well, based on what? Because your echo chamber told you, oh, good job. Great, great stuff. No, you need to take that to the public. And you need to see in what order do they rank. So while you think one message is, is going to hit and, and woo the crowd, our data is going to show you, no, maybe it's these messages. But then we're going to take it a step further. And we're going to say among these demographics and among these subgroups. And so now when you're going to different organizations or you're going to, to, uh, to, to different audiences, now you know how to read, engage better, and, and prepare and connect with the audience better. So we're providing you uh, with, with essentially what, what you need in order to, to brand your campaign. And so I, I like the, the, the comparison that Jim keeps returning to with, with market research, but how to mine for, for, for gold, that was your, your question, Luke. You have to look beyond the obvious. You have to. You can't get. You can't get um, caught up in in one way of reading the data. You know, I think I think if 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 you think that you can read data in a way that's routine and rote, it that's never the case. Sometimes you 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 know you really have to dive deeply into it, and and have and also having a, a, an understanding of history and culture. Um, and, and basically, I, I would say an interdisciplinary approach. I think there are some pollsters who rely too much on their backgrounds in business or their backgrounds in economics or their backgrounds in politics. We're anthropologists, sociologists. Um, we study ideology. And uh, sometimes we even dabble in poetry. And so when you bring that holistic approach to polling, that lends itself to the data coming to life and jumping out at you. Thank you, Jeremy. And, and looking beyond the obvious is something that you're very focused on as well, Keisha. And you have to deal with these walking, living brands on a, on a daily basis and, and doing your job. So can you share some of your insights in reporting on elected officials when it comes to polling generally, specifically if there's a poll that they don't like and, and you're running a story on that? Can you share a little bit of what that's like? Yeah, and I mean, I think that we're the, the obvious example in New York State is what we're dealing with right now with the governor. Um, the height of the pandemic, he was polling really well. I mean, maybe some of the highest in his career. I'm not sure historically, but I think it was about 73% uh, of public approval at one point. And, um, you know, people were putting out his name for a presidential candidate? Um, will he run for higher office? And then, um, you know, we've had the nursing home scandals, we've had the 
um, sexual harassment allegations. He's under numerous investigations, a federal probe, um, impeachment <laughs> proceedings. And so immediately we actually turned to the polls, right? Like, you know, can Cuomo stay in office? And what did the public think? And what turns the dial with the public? And, and it's been interesting to see the reporting that's come out. Um, the Washington Post has been doing a, a stellar job uh, in particular, as well as the Albany Times Union um, has really come out with a lot of information on just these deep dives in the background of just how important polling and numbers are to the governor and his staff when they're making decisions such as putting out a book, um, trying to uh, figure out when to put out the, the, the true number of nursing home deaths. Um, it, it's very clear, uh, at least from the reporting is showing, I, I haven't had a personal conversation with the governor about this, but um, you know that, that they are taking into consideration all of these things when they're making moves. Um, whether or not that's the best way uh, to, to govern, I'm not sure. I'm sure many people have uh, thoughts on that as well. Um, but it is, it is having a role. And, it, and it's, it's playing a role in our reporting when we're looking at, you know, can Cuomo survive uh, his, his running for re-election in 2022? Will he even get that far? Uh, right now, we're seeing in the polls that it's not as bad as it, as it seems, I guess, when all of this started unfolding, we were expecting, um, you know, people at home with the voters to say, well, you know, let's get him out. How can he even be in there? But he's actually weathering it pretty well in the polls. Um, however, when the polls do drop and we ask his office, you know, hey, can you comment? We saw the polls were a little bit lower. They're like, ah, polls, it depends on who you ask and, you know, pretend like they're not bothered by it. But you can tell it's, um, it's something that they're following as well. And we're following just to see you know, is what's in the wind? Does the Democratic Party need to come up with another candidate? Um, are there what what Republican candidates are out there? How are they polling um, in comparison to the governor? And and looking ahead to 2022, I mean, we're already in the thick of it, even though it, it seems like campaigning is far away. Um, and I think the polls really show that now. And to follow up on your, your question, Keisha, Jim and you and Jeremy both articulately shared the, the benefits of polling and, and how useful it can be in so many ways. But, you know, Keisha's point in part raises the question, can or do elected officials rely too much on polls? Uh, you know, can the focus on message, messaging and style erode substance or are candidates pretty malleable and, and they do what they need to do to win or be successful as they define that? Yeah, it's a great point by Keisha, and it's a great question by you. Um, I would say, trust me, having worked for Donald Trump, he wasn't taking any positions based off of polls. Um, a lot of it he was doing off gut instincts. And by the way, most, I think, po political figures, most political leaders, I think on the right and the left are pretty much the same way. They believe what they believe. A poll's not going to change their position on abortion, taxes, education, whatever it is. It's like I said, a lot of times what we're doing is, okay, we're trying to figure out the best messaging to help them sell their ideas and figure out who the heck they're going to target. And I always say, you know, there's a quote that I love. It's from um, Abraham Lincoln. He says, public opinion in this country is everything. That was Abraham Lincoln. Public opinion in this country is everything. Um, that was way before we had polls and focus groups and market research and all that other kind of stuff. And you know what Abraham Lincoln was talking about? He was talking about ending slavery when he made that comment, because he was saying folks still wouldn't be free. He knew it was before his time, Jim Crow laws and things like that. They were going to come until we change public opinion. So I think in a lot of ways, I think the good part, the good part about uh, polling and its effect on political candidates is I think it helps them be more in tune with what's going on in the world. Because as both Jeremy and Keisha will tell you, people that spend too much time in places like Washington and Albany, they tend to get really out of touch. And what the polling does at times is tell you, you know, you might think, hey, it's education is the most important issue, or it might be healthcare, when, you know, people are still talking about things like jobs. Like right now, what, what we've seen is kind of a shift over the last month or two 
COVID is still out there. The coronavirus is still important, but hey, and the economy, there's a sense the economy is getting better, but there's still a lot of people out there hurting. By the way, especially in a place like upstate New York, where you know there's a lot of folks in upstate New York, even when economic times are good, they feel like they've been left behind. So I think what it does is at times, even though it may not be perfect, it helps the politicians stay in touch with what really matters to folks. Because trust me, they, you know, it's like Keisha was saying, they'll say, oh, we don't pay attention to polls and all that other kind of stuff. Trust me, they pay, they pay attention to polls and it's why they spend so much money on polls. And I will tell you too, you can see it in the campaign finance reports the Democrats spend a lot more money than the Republicans do on polling. I'm trying to get the Republicans to spend more. <laughs> let's let's build on that theme of public perceptions of polling, Jeremy. People follow polls; they get cited. They, they're cited often. They're the, the topic of conversation, but there can be a, a lot of misunderstanding uh, about polling. So, Jeremy, what do you think some of the biggest misperceptions people have about polling, and, and what suggestions do you have for properly reading and consuming polls. Yeah, so I think, okay, it, when it comes to election polling, it is forecasting because you come out with a poll two days before election or a day before election and you're essentially, you, what you're saying is here's what the voter turnout on election day is going to be. And, and so in that regards, it, 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 there, it it is forecasting, but I think, I, and I don't know who's to blame for this. I, I, I don't wanna say journalists, Kesha, because I, I don't think that's true, but I, I mean, I, I've had, I've, I've heard journalists admit, you know, we, that, that essentially what I'm trying to say is that the public to, to a certain degree has made polling synonymous with predicting. And again, in election polls, there is a fork. I, I like the word forecast better I think it gives us a, a little bit more leeway for margin of error, right? And plus there's an old Arab um, saying that he who predicts is a fool. But um, yeah, I, I th so I think that, that somewhere along the way it, it got attached to polling is predicting. And so, but, but what about before elections and what about after elections? It's gauging. And so uh, how, how do we combat that? Well, I think the other thing too, is that people run with the information. So, I mean, look at 2016 and 2020, and for a lot of organizations, it was a disaster. They were saying, oh, there's an 11, 12, uh, 13 point lead. In some uh, you know, battleground states, it was a 17 point uh, spread, and it was nothing like that. And so the public, the readers, and including the journalists, because they're readers of the polls too, they need to stop treating it like, like clickbait headlines. Read beyond the headline. Go into, look at the methodology of the poll. Get, you know, uh, learn about methodology. It's, it's, it's not really that complicated. It, it, I know it looks intimidating, but, but it really isn't. Look at the data that they're putting out. And, when, and you know, I saw some polls leading up to the election they were basically saying that, oh, you know, we're predicting, um, you know, among all of the voters in the 2020 election, it will be 40% Democrat and like 27% Republican. That's ridiculous. Look at 2016. It was close, right? Why is 2020, why would 2020 be, be any different? So I, I think between echo chambers, believing what you want to believe, and not looking at the methodology and the actual data and just treating like it's a headline, the, the polling numbers, you got to dive into it. And we all, I, I, I mean, I, we do and, and, and Jim and, and Kesha do, but, but others have to, um, they have to really look into it more. And, and I just would, I'd love to piggyback on that because I think 2016 was a wake up call for journalists as well. Um, I, I actually was working for Politico at the time, um, again, still covering New York State, so I wasn't as in depth in the, the um, national elections, but we had a big meetup in DC and they were like, 
what happened? And I think that this year you saw journalists, at least for the most part, not everyone, because, you know, we're not all the same. Um, but I, I think you did see reporters a little bit more cautious this year, maybe not calling elections as as early as they would. Um, you know, of course, we were, we had a, a number of different things with this election being different due to COVID, um, a lot of different types of voting. So it was a little bit of a different animal. But I think people were a lot more cautious. And I think as a reporter, you know, a lot of the journalists are saying, you know, what can we do differently when we're when we're talking about elections in particular with polling and making sure that we're not jumping to conclusions, basing it on this as as, you know, a, a fact and this is what's going to happen. It, it is a poll and you need to be cognizant of, of who's uh, conducting the poll, what's going into it and who's answering the poll, because the poll is only as good as how many people and what type of, of person is answering to. Right. Jim, building on that. Would you say that that most polls are right most of the time? I mean, I know Jeremy mentioned specific examples of polls being wrong, the presidential election, certain states. I'm sure you have your examples as well. Do you think that casts a cloud over polling as a whole? That's perhaps unfair, or are we in a, in a crisis mode when we think about the state of polling post 2016? Yeah, you you know, I look, I think. Most and look, good polling, it's not cheap, um, it's expensive. And you know, you got to call off a voter list, you got to do likely voters, which is one of the things. Whenever I see one of Jeremy's polls in print, I think this thing's right. I remember getting a call in the 16 election from one of Keisha's uh, uh colleagues from Politico, from Michael Caputo, um, down in Florida. He's asking me about the Florida polls, and uh. You know, somebody, I think they had Trump down 12 to Hillary Clinton. And I said, you know, Florida, it's just not. And he was a smart reporter. And he said, yeah, it doesn't make sense. And I remember looking at the demos for him, walking him through the demos on the poll. The poll was like plus 10 percent Democrat when that's not Florida in elections. They usually have more Republicans that actually show up for elections than Democrats do. And to Jeremy's point, I remember literally, I'm sitting in the chair I'm sitting in right now. I get the call from President Trump. He's asking me what's wrong with the Wisconsin poll, which I think you were probably referring to before, where President Trump was down 17. Well, why did that poll have him down 17 points? Because they had Democrats at 48 percent, and I think they had Republicans at only about 25 percent. If you know Wisconsin, it's a third Republican, it's a third Democrat, it's a third independent, and that's reality. That's why Ron Johnson is a Republican, won there twice. It's why um, Scott Walker won three elections there. It's literally, Wisconsin is not a Democratic state anymore. It's really become more of a swing state, just like certain states have become more Democratic, like Virginia, etc. So it's one of those things where I think you want the buyer to beware. I, I agree with you know Keisha's point about the media has gotten a lot smarter. They're starting to look at demographics and whatnot. There was a national poll for one of the universities that just came out, I think today and yesterday. And the sample size was only what, 23% Republican, all right? We have not had Republicans be less than a third of the electorate in decades. And if you believe the exit polls, like the CNN, the New York Times, the Fox exit polls, um, they basically had party at almost even or Democrats 37, Republicans 36. So I think that's one of the big problems they have for whatever reason. And you'd have to ask them why. But they seem to they say they were having trouble getting Trump voters. But I think it was more just a fact for whatever reason they were undersampling Republicans. Why they were doing that, you'd have to ask them. But I think it's let the buyer beware. Look at the demographics. And look, if somebody's putting a poll out there, if I'm putting a poll out there, you've got to be willing to answer tough questions about the poll. Thank you, Jim. Jeremy, building on that, thinking more about the challenges in uh, regards to doing effective polling. Uh, Jim mentioned uh, turnout. Obviously, that's a big consideration, trying to anticipate that, the, the partisan break, trying to anticipate the partisan breakdown of the electorate, what, what are some other challenges that you think uh, face forecasting? I wondered if you, you tested that word when you raised it earlier based on our discussion about messaging, but what do you think are some of the challenges in uh, 
forecasting building on this team? Well, I, I think right now with what, well, you know, I think the obvious answer is, is so that happened in 2016 and, and there was kind of a, a, a mood that was like, oh, I don't trust the polls anymore. And then this happened again in 2020. Of course, there were, there were organizations that were, that did, that did get it right or, or were, were well within the, the spread. I, I, I'm proud to say that we at Zogby Strategies, we had the, the race uh, pretty close all along. Um, the, yeah, um, but I, so I think it'll be interesting to see as we go into to 2021, whether that will, will continue, whether that will have a lasting effect. So, I mean, that's the most immediate um, challenge. Uh, I think, you know, just off the top of my head, I think, I, you know, it, it used to be a challenge. It, we, we talked a little bit about this before, the telephone. I mean, telephone is still considered the, the gold standard, but I mean, I remember seeing a Pew Research uh, statistic that, that said something like 6% that uh, the response rate for, for telephone polls, that, that's, that's abysmal, that's horrible. Um, I mean, when my dad started this business in 84, it was like 50%, right? So my question is who the heck still has a landline? I mean, I know people still have a landline. I, I know they do, but who really answers the, the, the telephone, especially when they're screening calls. And so I see online getting ready to eclipse telephone methodology because you have a nation of people 90% at least, maybe a little bit more connected to the internet with, with access to the internet. And so there's still just that little bit of cultural lag where a lot of pollsters, we get it. We get that online polling is the present and the future, but there are still some clients who, because they're listening to, to APOR or they're, they're just still glued to, to telephone that um, maybe they're not ready and so I, I think that you know that's just an, a, an immediate challenge that that is comes to the top of my mind is is getting polling used to the fact that online methodology is is the way now and into the future. I like to go back to Jim on that one. If you could share some thoughts about how technology is going to continue to reshape communication and polling, that some of the types of things that that you're thinking about in that regard as you do your work. Yeah. And, and five, six years ago, you were probably doing things just almost exclusively on the phone. And now this cycle, we were doing surveys in the presidential race. We were doing it what we call, you know, multimodal, where we were literally doing cell phones. We were doing, you know, we were doing text messaging and we're doing online surveys. And now one of the things we try to do with all those, and it's one of the problems where, you know, it just gets expensive with not just in terms of reaching somebody and putting together the lists, because you want to make sure these people are known voters. One of the problems you have with a lot of the media polls, they'll do what they call random digit dial, where they don't even know if these people are known voters. Like I see it a lot in a lot of the university and college polls, not to pick on them, but they'll get back these surveys where like four, a third of their sample, 40% of it, or independence, and that's not just reality. That's just not reality. Um, again, you look at the exit polls. You had about you know 37, 36 percent. It was less than a quarter of the electorate that were self-described independents. So you know that these people are actually voters. So I think you know to Jeremy's point. You know, people ask me, where do you think we're going to be now in a couple of years? You know, now we're doing things more, more and more on cell phone, obviously online doing text, you know, text surveys, now whatnot, I think you're going to have a lot of paid um, internet panels where you're literally going to be paying stuff. We do it on the corporate realm. Um, I'm not totally comfortable with it yet in terms of the political stuff, because you tend to get a little bit, you know, people that are in the online panels now, they tend to be a little bit more highly educated. Um, they tend to be, you know, younger and whatnot. But I think that's where we're going to be going to people, literally people online, paying them to do surveys, similar to what we do in focus groups right now. 
Thank you. As, as we begin to uh, transition here in a few minutes to questions from the audience, I, I encourage people in our Zoom session, if you do have questions, to send them to me in the chat. And as we move along here in the final 20 minutes, I will do my best to incorporate as many uh, questions as, as I can. Now, Keisha, we, we talked about how uh, campaigns and candidates commission polls and the different challenges and how they're used. When you've got a poll that comes from a political party or a partisan group, can you share a little bit about how you evaluate that, how you make decisions in regards to the ways in which you would potentially incorporate that into a story? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, like I said before, polling is, is another tool. So I'm gonna use it as I would any other tool. Um, you know, look at the background, who is it coming from? Um, if it's a Republican pollster, I'm probably gonna try to get a Democratic pollster in the story to even it out, or at least make sure that I'm I'm adding that information in. I mean, I think Jim has been my um, my Republican pollster for a lot of stories. Um, when I wanna get a, a different point of view, especially with, um, you know, the, the governor and the, um, both the, the Senate and the assembly led by Democrats, sometimes it's hard to get that other point of view in the story. And it's really important when you're looking at it because there are, you know, Republicans in New York state, I mean, especially in upstate New York and, and all across, um, you know, Western New York. And so the, the party that's in office right now is not necessarily speaking for all of New York State. So it's really important for the readers to get all those different sides to a story. Um, and when I'm getting a source, I am trying to figure out who it is. Um, perfect example, I used to be a transportation reporter for the Observer Dispatch in Utica. It was one of my uh, general assignment beats. And I, uh, whenever this was a, like an easy uh, there's a holiday coming up. What are the gas prices looking at? And I'm going to go to AAA and I'm going to ask who's traveling based on their polls and based on, you know, how gas prices are going to affect, um, you know, the consumer base. And that's really important for business reporting because you're looking at, okay, are people going to stay here? Are they going to leave? Does that mean vacation homes, um, you know, are going to be seeing fewer people? So th there's all these kind of cause and effects. Um, and in that case, you know, of course, the AAA ones are are, are biased because they're using their uh, their members uh, to pull this. So I'm keeping that in mind when I'm when I'm reading that there too. So just kind of, I, I usually try to balance out stories. Um, sometimes if it's just a political story, we'll use like a trusted polling site that we are familiar with. I know the Siena poll gets in there a lot um, for, for just general reporting. Um, right now, writing profiles about the governor and his sort of uh, decline from uh, high polling and public approval ratings uh, last year to where he's at now. Um, you know, we'll want to kind of use the polling number as uh, another piece of information that kind of describes a larger picture. Uh, Jim, you were described as the GOP pollster there by, by Keisha, which is certainly part of what you do, but you referenced earlier how you have Democratic clients, you have Republican clients. Um, part of what you do is analysis and helping your clients do market research, as you explained, but you also have the public persona where you're going on Fox News, as you referenced, and, and other such networks providing commentary and input as well. Can you talk a little bit about sort of where you would put yourself? Would you define yourself in a partisan way? Yes, no, how, how should we make sense of that? Yeah, and, and look, we are, we'll be the first ones to tell you, we're a Republican pollster and that's what we do. And for the most part, you know, we will work with Democrats on projects. Sometimes it's issue oriented or sometimes it's corporate work, usually not in the realm of a campaign. Um, I was, you know, I always tell people I was really proud to work for somebody like Mike Bloomberg um, when he was the mayor of New York City. Um, you know, even though, even when he first ran as a Republican, Mike was always a Democrat. One of the reasons he ran as a Republican, it was the best vehicle to be for him to be the mayor. And I think he did an excellent job as, you know, as mayor. And look, I always say, you know, Keisha knows when she calls me, I'm a Republican and I'm going to give her probably the Republican talking points at the time. But I also always tell everybody, look, we have a reputation. Um, and again, this is a small business. 
people know when you're right, when you're wrong. Um, I literally remember getting a call. I'm not going to mention her name from a national reporter a couple days after the 2016 election where she said to me, I heard you on Hannity. I was kind of shocked. She actually listened to Sean Hannity, but uh, she said, I heard you on Hannity and you said you thought that president Trump could win. I thought you were just spinning. And I said, no. And just like this time during the election, and this is an important point to keep in mind, um, probably about two and a half weeks out, you know, after President Trump got COVID, um, you know, we took a hit. There was no ants or ifs about, uh, about it. We took a hit when that happened. And the election probably, we would have lost pretty darn decisively. Um, but President Trump had a really good last two and a half weeks. You know, he did well in the last debate. He was out there doing uh, a lot of events across the country in the battleground states. Public opinion changes and it changes over time. You wouldn't think with the electorate being so polarized, but things like turnout and whatnot change. So that's something we should keep in mind. I think that was one of the mistakes also this cycle was, especially with a lot of the early voting, people stopped polling early when people were still making up their minds and they were still changing their minds towards the end. But that's, you know, that's something you definitely want to want to keep track of. And I would tell you in the last two elections, probably the last three elections, going back to Obama's reelect. You saw some significant changes in the last two weeks of the campaign, couple of weeks of the campaign. Like Mitt Romney was ahead after that first debate. And then Obama had the good last month of the campaign. And you would have said the same thing. Hillary Clinton was doing well. Um, you know, about midway through October, again, Trump got momentum there. And that's why you had an election this time where literally you think about it. All these votes that were cast this time, what was it, close to 160 million votes? And really, there was about 43,000 votes in Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia that decided the race. And it just goes to tell you, we're playing on the margins. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to start incorporating some questions from our audience. And I'll direct the first one to, to you, Jeremy. Uh, we had a question here from Michael. Are polling companies using indirect means like mining social media posts to inform their market research for candidates? Um, we've never done that on the political side. We, we've done that um, for, for, let's say, private polling or, or, or candidate, not candidates, but yeah, market research where it was an area you, where you couldn't penetrate unless you were going to do intercept surveys on Main Street. And so we came up with a little bit of a, a clever way to, to um, not mine for social media, but but release the poll through social media, all the while telling the client that, look, this isn't scientific, but it gets you closer to uh, a closer reading of, of the public in the area than, than you're gonna be able to get. Jim, do you have anything to, to offer on that? Let me unmute. Um, yeah, and I, I think, look, a lot of times when you're doing this kind of research, it may not necessarily be to predict an election, but if you like, let's say you do a poll on the Daily Beast, uh, you know, for something like people that subscribe to something, you know, like um, a left wing kind of a publication or a left of center publication like the Daily Beast. And you, you might want to poll them for information because it might matter where you think, you know, these folks are. It's obviously going to be skewed, but you still have good information based off of that. So I think those kinds of intercept surveys, you know, in terms of what Jeremy was talking about, they all have their place. But again, you know, what we try to do when you're in an election, it's more of a random select because you're trying to be, you know, a little bit more, you know, uh, you're trying to be more objective as well as make sure it matches up with the models of what you think the election is going to look like. Thank you. Keisha, we've got a, a question about margin of error when it comes to polls. And, and I wondered, is that something you look at in evaluating what polls to use in your reporting? Um, what takeaways might be useful to your audience? Does that factor into your thought process at all? Yeah, um, not, not as much. Um, I will say I, um, 
I haven't covered a lot of, especially national, I think national reporting um, for federal elections uses a lot more than than I have in the past. Um, so I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it, but you know, I, I would certainly look at the margin of error and, and how large it is in, in trying to see, you know, is this just like any bit of information, is this bit of information accurate or, um, you know, is it actually telling me something or is it just, um, I mean, even just, there was um, a research paper that had come out and we were looking at, um, these uh, chemicals that are that are prevalent uh, from Teflon pans, the PFAS chemicals, and uh, one of the the reports said that there was uh, a, an amount of these chemicals in the ground, and then you know it turns out that there there actually are an amount everywhere, so it's not necessarily coming from that one source that they're claiming it to be. So I think it's just like anything else where you need to have a large enough. Uh, group to be asking the information from and then also looking at, you know, how how accurate that's going to be. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, following up on this, Jordan inquires, what is an acceptable margin of error when polling a specific demographic in an election? Okay. So, I mean, just spotting off the top of my head, nationwide election, if we're doing, um, yeah, nationwide, like a thousand, which is going to yield plus or minus 3.2. If you want to get into, say, African Americans, we want to have of that 1,000, we want to have anywhere from 120 to 150. And the same for, uh, for, for Hispanics, about anywhere from 120 to 150. That's representative of the population. Now, off the top of my head, I think that yields about a plus or minus 9 or 10% uh, margin of error. But it, you can look that that sounds high, but you can look at it. You know historically where where they've stood and and how they voted. So it it's it suffice. It will suffice. Thank you, and and Jim, I, I will give you the opportunity to if you want to weigh in at that at all. And then I'll add another question on there uh, that that we got. Is there a particular poll that has stuck out to you? Uh, throughout your career where a candidate may have done a lot better or worse than you anticipated? Anything uh, anecdotal you might want to share there? Um, I'll, I'll answer that question in a second, but I think to go back to your point on margin of error, I always tell people, because people always ask, okay, how does a poll of, you know, three, 400 in a congressional district or a thousand nationally, how can that tell me what the whole country is thinking? And we always say, look, you have a margin of error there, but I always tell it, it's like a blood test. You get a blood test, it can tell you, you know, what you have, what kind of disease, infection, or whether or not, or whether you're healthy or whatnot. It's very similar to a blood test. And if you don't like that analogy, I always tell everybody it's similar to, you know, you have the big bowl of soup, you know, at the store or at the restaurant. They go, they put the ladle in, you come out, and you've got pretty much everything that's in the soup. That's basically what it is and how we pull. Um, to go to your, we've all had misses. Um, you know, out there. And when you do, you know, like literally we've done thousands and thousands of polls over the years. Um, and it was funny because I'll go back to, you know, what we were doing in 2016 and we did something similar this time. We we're doing different kind of models. The unweighted surveys, the surveys that we weren't weighting in the battleground states were the ones that were accurate. The ones where we used the Obama model in 2012, where Obama had a huge turnout among millennials, among Hispanics, among African-Americans, those were the ones for 2016 that were wrong. And that was one of the, I think, one of the misses where a lot of folks were using that Obama model back then. And this time, again, the unweighted surveys were the ones that tended to be more accurate as opposed to like our micro-targeting models that we were. So I, I find that kind of interesting that literally the unweighted surveys, letting people, it's one of the reasons why I've always liked Jeremy and Zogby's polls because they actually screen for likely voters just like we do because I always say, you're doing a survey, it's supposed to be a survey about politics, but you're talking to adults or registered voters. You're not talking to people that are telling you they're actually going to vote. And there is a difference. There is a difference in the electorate. So, so, you know, I think it's, I think it's one of those things where um, I still believe, and you, and, and by the way, if you looked at it 
back in 2016, the national polls were pretty close to what actually happened in terms of the popular vote, and they weren't too far off this time. And I think one of the reasons why you had a lot of these big misses in the states was because they stopped polling two, three weeks out because of all the early voting. And I think that was a mistake. And like I said, we in the campaign, and I was seeing it from my other clients, we were seeing that late movement towards President Trump and Republicans there at the end that you saw in the congressional races. Thank you. We got a question uh, direct to Jeremy, please, about social desirability bias. Is it possible for pollsters to identify it? How can pollsters overcome it? Wow, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, Social desirability, just refresh my memory. I, I think I have an idea what social desirability bias is, but I wanna make sure that, 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 that I. Well, the audience member uh, referenced um, the possibility of blending survey data with historical voting data and open data, such as Google search trends, Twitter sentiment to, to try to over, overcome this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to defer to Jim on that one. What do you think, Jim? I think it's actually, I think it's a great question. If that is one of your students from Utica College, they get an A. Because <laughs> sometimes what I tell people, it's not what they say to you. It's what they don't say to you. One of the things I was doing in these elections was, and I remember a lot of my clients would say, no, it's a wasted question. I'd ask a, an, an image rating, you know, do you have a favorable or unfavorable uh, opinion of the police and law enforcement? Do you have a favorable or unfavorable opinion of uh, Black Lives Matter? And what would happen is there was usually a pretty big segment of the voters, usually like a third, sometimes you know, a little bit more than a third or a quarter of the voter. Yep, I like law enforcement. I like the police. And oh, by the way, I like Black Lives Matter. And though that group of voters in many cases was a really important swing group where they were, where they were telling you, hey, I like law enforcement, but you know, I think some of the things that are going on right now, whether it was with George Floyd or some of the, some of the other cases that happened out there, and it was a good way to get to those voters that were saying that were saying to you, hey, you know what? I don't like some of these racial tensions that are out there, but I also want people to keep us safe. I think it's something that, you know, it is a live and well out there. And it's also a reason why sometimes you have to ask questions in a couple of different ways, if you know what I mean. Thank you very much. Well, we're, we're going to close on this question and uh, we could talk for many more hours. This has been a wonderful conversation and it, it comes from Audra and Audra is interested in how uh, tonight's topic polling should be on every student's mind irrespective of their major. And so I'll open that up and, and whoever wants to respond and kind of provide what other closing thoughts related that you might have this would be a great time to do it. I'll go ahead because I, I dodged a question. Um, <laughs> I think um, polling is essential to democracy. It's essential to democracy because you have to have that loop of feedback between the government and the public. But not only that, you have to be able to talk about and engage controversial issues just as much as you have to do with values. So what I see happening on the ground is I see an alarming trend where, and you know, my dad and I do a weekly podcast and, and we've talked about this phenomenon. We're entering kind of this, this tribalistic culture where, where people are losing empathy for those that, that they do not identify with or, or share values with. And as a result, I'm seeing more and more that yeah. if, you don't, if you don't agree with me, if, if you don't think like I do, then I can't and, talk to you. And that there's, there's, um, there's a sense of shunning, there's a sense of ad hominem attacks, not taking the time to empathize with the other. And so I think polling is a great platform and a great study and a great field that can foster that. Um, if, if we probe values 
and if we we talk about controversial things, I'm doing that with with this uh, intelligence year report, um, which which I, I'm due for for issue 14 pretty soon. But it, in one of them, issue number nine, it was called the search for common ground. So while everybody was focused on division. I came out and, and we asked in a poll, well, what could people actually come to agree on? So I had a, a notion that, that um, you know, um, par party term limits and not actually, I'm sorry, um, term limits, for not, not only for, uh, for Congress and, and for senators, but also for high level federal bureaucrats, 90% of the public could get on board with that. Uh, another question, I, I just had a hunch that people would would really get on board was getting rid of corporate PAC money in campaigns and elections. 90% of the public. So how would we know that if we're not engaging the public and, and bridging that gap between the government and the public? And so that's why polling should be on the minds because it can be a wonderful tool to, to help discover where we are now, but where we should also be. Anybody I'll, else like to go I'll weigh sure, in please. too. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think that it's important to pay attention to polls, um, not just being a journalist to kind of gauge what's going on and, and get different ideas of, of public opinion, public thought on what's important, um, but also as, a, as just a professional and a voter and a citizen, just being informed on what's out there. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Kim Landon. She's on the call. I saw um, my uh, professor and uh, now life advisor. I still keep her on. No, no longer academic advisor, but um, she and I chat frequently. And one of the most important things she taught me was to read, to become a better writer, and to become a better uh, just overall citizen. I think paying attention to the polls is, is the same as paying attention to the news and paying attention to what's going on, making sure that you're getting, you know, every angle. Um, whether it's Jim or Jeremy uh, calling for <laughs> whatever side I would, I'm looking for in a story, but I think it's important to pay attention to that um, and just be well informed. Yeah. You know, and I used the uh, Lincoln quote before, now I'm going to use Thomas Jefferson, where he said, the basis of our government being is the opinion of the people. And again, before we had these polls and we had focus groups and all that other kind of stuff, they understood, as well as our leaders today, Obama used to talk about a public opinion all the time. Um, and let me tell you, nobody polled more than the Obama White House. Be, and I, again, I think it helped them stay in touch with what was going on out there. Um, and and that's, that's a good thing. I don't care what you're doing, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a nurse, or whether you're a coach, you know, public opinion matters. It matters what you know, the people, whether you have consumers, whether you have customers or whether you have voters, you want to know what's on their mind. Because I tell people, especially in political circles, because we spend our whole lives, you know, watching Fox News and CNN and MSNBC, listening to talk radio and all. Normal people don't do that. Um, I'm, we've, pro we've got a lot of political activist types on this call. We're weird. Um, this is what we do. You know, most people right now at this time of night, you know, non-COVID, they're out at their kid's game or something. Um, so that's, I think it literally helps the politicians stay in touch with the electorate. And I think, I think it's a good thing. On behalf of the Utica College Center of Public Affairs and Election Research, I would like to give a great big thanks to our Utica College alumni, Keisha Klukey, Jeremy Zogby, and Jim McLaughlin for an excellent and insightful panel discussion this evening. And I'd also like to thank you and the audience for being with us this evening and for your wonderful questions. This now concludes our program. Thank you so much.